Let's get to Kojo because I haven't spoken to him in ages and it's always good to have him on the show. Uh, so Kojo's got a new book out and we remember him from his days as an editor of many of the magazines that we love. And uh, Kojo before is with us now this morning to talk about his new book, which is called Listen to Your Footsteps. But first, let's catch up with you. How are you, Kojo? How are things going? I'm good. How are you guys doing? Good, man. You know, the first thing anyone asks anybody these days is, have you had COVID? No, fortunately, I have not. Oh, thank uh, God. All right. And, and, and I'm, I'm really trying to keep it that way. But uh, I've, been, I've been living a lockdown for about five years. So, I mean, hopefully that, hopefully that helps. Yeah. Listen, for, for people who are introverted or people who uh, are slightly misanthropic, this, is, uh, this has been a great time. So what have you been doing during your lockdown? You've been writing books. Uh, tell us about what you've been up to. My life especially that first like six months, my routine in my life didn't really change. I mean, I, I work from home. Mm -hmm. um, it's getting the kids to school in the morning. Um, during lockdown, it was getting them set up in front of whatever device it was that they were, they were using to study. And then, yeah, just kind of looking for work, doing work when it came in, freelancing, and then, yeah, writing the book. But, I mean, like my routine literally is still the same. Well, that sounds very, uh, to, to you, like no gear change at all. Very, very easy. This has been a, a, a very pleasant experience. So we were talking just a little while ago about like, all the changes that have happened in everyone else's lives. And um, we were just joking because there are all these people who Photoshop themselves on social media all the time. Uh, Gilly and, and Sia were saying that there are, are suddenly male makeup products. Now, I know you're not in the magazine business anymore, but yeah. uh, do you think that's a growing thing? I mean, you, you, this, is, this used to be your wheelhouse of kind of maintaining an, an eye, keeping an eye on trends, uh, watching what was going on with, uh, you know, with men, with kind of what men are interested in, grooming, uh, mm -hmm. dating, all that kind of thing. Is this something that's at, at all picked up in South Africa or are we just on a, on a tangent? I don't know. Like it's, I, I mean, I've seen makeup products and the first, you know, the first time I actually went to a launch it must mm -hmm. be like 2014. I went to a launch and, and they had makeup product, makeup products for men. Um, I'm kind of I'm neither here nor there about it. Like I personally don't think I need makeup. Um, and you know, if somebody else wants to wear makeup, I'll believe for them. But you know, uh, these these things kind of they kind of come and go. Um, yeah. And I I don't think they. they Things like this are not necessarily the things that are going to become mainstream. Um, and, and the debate and the conversation around them usually just kind of belies whatever other prejudices or whatever other perspectives mm -hmm. that we may have. Um, and I think there are, more, there, are more, there are more important things in the world to worry about. I mean, I, I saw yeah, yesterday, I saw yesterday I, there was this whole conversation about, um, I think, Rich Nisi in a skirt um, hmm. and pictures of him in a skirt. And now it's, it's discussions around masculinity and what it means. Right. And it's just like, well, actually, you know, I've got, I've got bigger fish, you know, I've got bigger things to right. worry about than, than, you know, than who's, who's deciding what they're comfortable with. Well, I Preach. mean, there is something to it. South Africans, we, we have, um, probably some, some very odd ideas of what masculinity is, considering the kind of state that our society's in, and also the way that we have um, you know, an outrageous level of abuse in, in society. That's no doubt due to the fact that men are not living up to any kind of standard. And if we have standards, they're probably the wrong ones. But it is interesting that we live in a country too, where people, if um, someone wears something, like you talk about Rich Mnisi wearing a skirt, or if someone puts on makeup and they're a guy, then that that gets looked at askance in other countries that might not be such a big deal. Yeah, because I mean, there's, there's so much, I guess, in reality, there's kind of so much that we're dealing with. Um, and I agree, like, like you're saying, this, this idea of masculinity, um, and there's a clinical psychologist I talked to some, some years back, and he kind of shaped a lot of my thinking. And he talked about masculinities as a plural. Mm -hmm. um, and he talked, he talked about, you know, to a certain extent, it's kind of it's performative, um, right? In terms of like we we manifest like different femininities or masculinities, uh, and and the problem is that everything, all of that, is tied to kind of like a particular role, um, a particular thing that I'm supposed to be doing, um, and as as our society has shifted, kind of we haven't shifted with that thinking, 
um, you know, so as a man, if I'm not bringing home the bacon, um, you know, if I'm not bringing home the bacon, then I'm less than. Meanwhile, yeah. you, meanwhile, we have like hectic unemployment. The mm. even even just the employment landscape like totally changed from let's say pre ninety four till today. Right? Um, and yeah, I mean, it is this whole thing of that. I I I am very much a you know focus on what I can control um, and kind of right. live my li- live my own life to the best of my ability. And if the way somebody else is living their life is not destructive and doesn't impede on my life, um, you know, like good for them. Like, and that's well, that's kind of that's kind of been my approach. So so because of that, I yeah I I don't really. I don't, don't really get engage a lot. I don't, yeah, I don't really engage with a lot of this yeah. stuff because I've been in the media. I kind of I watch it and I watch the conversations, but yeah, you you can you can observe rather than having to get involved. So Absolutely. listen, this brings us this brings us to your book, and um, I'm I'm really interested. I'm sure Gillian and CR too. First of all, what decided what what made you decide to to write a book? And and it's obviously a, a you know this is this is drawing on your own experiences so it's semi autobiographical i mean it it's a bunch of essays where you are basically speaking as a son a father a husband a brother and someone who's committed to kind of sorting themselves out in the yeah. world which is i suppose all of those are things that that many of us go through and and that many of us would like to to put down in writing it's a therapeutic exercise first of all it's it's cathartic but what was the the main motivation for for actually getting it done because all of us have a book in our heads very few of us actually end, end up writing them down so look, my first book i started it in 2012 when i was actually still a destiny man um, right. and, and it was around fatherhood so it was it was after my son was born i started kind of scribbling stuff and and and, and reflecting on, on that journey um, and and I and I never actually I never got around to finishing it just because of time. I mean, I was in the magazine, I was busy, I was doing a, you know kind of running around doing a lot of things, mm-hmm. and and in, and so I've, I've kind of I've I do believe I you know I did believe that I had a book in me, and I write every day. I mean, I continue to write every day because that's my work, um, right. and and then. I, so about a year and a half ago, I actually just started writing, you know, putting these thoughts down as little essays, little reflections, uh, because I also journal every morning. So the first thing I do in the morning is, is I do morning pages. So I journal for like three pages uh, before, before I do anything else. And I started kind of building a little collection of these, you know, some long, some short, these, these essays and these reflections. And and reached out, you know, reached out to Pan McMillan, um, who I'd, I'd had a, I had a relationship with, and I'd been kind of conversating with him before to go. Yo, listen, you have, got- um, you, you've, you've published two books of poetry before this as well, so you, it's not as if you're new to the idea of publishing. Yeah, but that feels weird because I mean, like I self-published. My father paid for the printing of the books. Oh, okay. so I, put, I put I put the things together. It, it didn't feel it didn't feel it didn't feel like real publishing. Like I had, okay. I had a, I had a strange form of imposter syndrome when it came to actually being an author. You know, friends would say you've been, you've published your own books, and I'm like, yeah, but you know, like my father said, why don't you publish a book of poetry? And I'm like, I don't have money. He says, well, I'll pay for the printing. So like, cool. Then I'll put a put, I'll put, I'll put a book together. Like you know, I know enough people. I know photographers. A friend of mine took, you know, took a picture of the cover. I, I, you know, compiled the poems, edited them went to a publisher and said, hey, listen, I've got this book, how much? And they told me, and I gave them the book and the cover, and then they gave me 500 copies later. Yeah. Okay, well, it counts. I mean, these days, self And you have a great relationship with your dad. I mean, let's count our blessings, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, my, no. father was my, my father was my main and only parent from when I was, what, yeah. 14 months? Yeah. And so, he believed mom, in you, which is great. Your mum died when you were when you were very young, and uh, yeah. you talk about that in the book. You talk about being raised only by your dad and kind of how you formed your identity around that. Now it's a different story to most people who you know. There's so many people in South Africa raised by single moms, um, mm-hmm. so I think that alone is is an interesting take on things, which we haven't heard more than 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 and we, we certainly haven't heard as much as as we have from single moms or from kids who've been raised by single moms so it would be interesting to compare the experiences and then also living as an immigrant um because 
you are of German and Ghanaian extraction. You lived in Lesotho for a long time. You, mm. you, you're South African now. And all of that must have been an interesting way to shape the character that you are, because there's no doubt that you, you know, you've really made an impact in the media world. You've, you've been one of those people whose name is well known, and you're one of those people who's produced some great stuff. And I'm just interested in where you think the major influences in your life might have come from. Um, I mean, as a starting point, my father. And, mm. and so some of these things, I mean, the interesting thing is, if, a, if for example, I'd stayed in the sort of, I do wonder whether I'd, I'd have been able to, or I'd have written this book this way. Uh, because moving to South Africa and, and the challenges and the journey of this country um, has forced me to, you know, to, to really look at certain things. Um, you know, when I was growing up in Lesotho, I was my father's son. My father was well known in the society. It was a small, you know, it's a, obviously a smaller kind of society and smaller city than, than you know, Johannesburg. And mm. I, I was my father's son. And I was, you know, my younger brother and sister's older brother. Um, or I was the guy who went to that school who was interested in these things or, the, you know, did that or went to these parties or hung out with that group of people. Um, and it's, it's in coming to South Africa where, you know, all of a sudden um, I'm having conversations around just because I have a particular complexion and hair texture does, doesn't mean that I have to be colored um, and what that means for identity, um, you know, and also, this I mean, I'm, I'm still, I'm still, yeah, sorry, yeah. Such a, this is such a prickly subject, but I, I love getting into it because what certain people regard as their colored identity, especially here in South Africa, is so different to what other people think of when they think of their, of their colored identity. I mean, you know, in America, they say mixed race. They would never use the word colored because it's actually a slur. Um, you've got people who have a, a white parent and a black parent. You have people who have two colored parents. You have people who have a mixture of those different things. And they all see each other in different ways. Um, and they see themselves in different ways. And there isn't really a straightforward colored identity, is there, Kojo? I think there is. Um, and I say that because, because within a South African context, I view colored as a, let's call it an ethnic group in the same way yeah. that you'd have that you'd have Zulu, Kosa, Soto, etc. Um, mm -hmm. the, the challenge becomes when you come from outside. So, yeah. so within a South African within a South African context, there is an ethnic group that is coloured. That's that's kind of that's come kind of my view, and it took me a while to kind of get to that point to make sense of it. Outside of South Africa and the US, the reason why coloured is considered a slur is historical, and you have to look at it contextual. Um, you know, you went from you went from you know um, coloured Negro. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. And there's that journey. There's that journey, and there's that very specific context. Um, so you have people like me, for example, who let's say I'm biracial. Depending on where you're in the world, I'm biracial. I'm mixed race. Mm -hmm. um, and and from a let's call it an ethnicity or a heritage perspective, like I'm operating with Ghanaian and German. That's kind of my heritage, and that that influences. You talk about influences that also influences kind of my version of culture, uh, my you know how how I view the world, my ritual, etc. Mm. Um, the problem, the the challenge becomes, and the challenge I had when I came to South Africa is that that's tied to race as opposed to mm. as opposed to her, as opposed to heritage or culture. Right, mm. um, and and in South Africa, I found that even with you know even with with say black, there was no understanding of nuance, because you can be black, but you know black people are so nuanced within this country, um, mm. whereas with white the nuance was there, and and I found that especially working in the media, right. So the, uh, uh, that that yeah. that's a fascinating thing to reflect on because you know German, I mean South Africa apparently has the the second largest or the largest German population outside of uh, of Germany in the Southern Hemisphere. They've also, you know, we, we've, we've kind of got stereotypical ideas of what Germans are, and some of them are funny and some of them are really quite insulting. Um, but it's interesting, this, this idea of, 
of culture versus race because South Africans haven't really grappled with that properly. Yeah, um, absolutely. We're still, do you agree, Gilly? I mean, we're still dealing with race. I can tell race. you that from, from uh, you know, uh, you talk about nuance. It's interesting. Like, I, I used to think you were right, that there was no understanding of nuance uh, in black, and only in black culture. But to, to if, in my experience of performing for audiences all over this country, I learned very, very quickly, the hard way, that there was no one seeing the nuance in my, I, I'm seen as a white woman. It doesn't, mm. if I, even when I talk about being Jewish, that is now something, a foreign thing that I've now introduced. And there's no, um, there's very, very few audiences that I perform for where they go, oh, I understand that that is a, another thing or an additional thing or a, you know, a new, a nuanced part of the thing. For the most part, I think we lack an understanding of nuance in one another's races and cultures. And, and I think also the openness to, to recognize that we each have different experiences. Yeah, yeah and, and, sure. and, and, and and therefore, there's there's no experience that's that's more valid than the next. Um, yeah. and, and 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 for us to find our way through, uh, find our way through this is, is is to open ourselves up more to that. I mean, I, I I really believe one of the biggest causes of ills in this world overall uh, it is a lack of empathy, um, and I do write about it in the book. Like, I. I try to teach, I don't know how to do it. I don't know how you go about doing that. But it's it's essentially, you know, empathy for me means means kind of recognizing the similarities um, uh, and while recognizing the, dif the, the differences, but also just understanding that the next person is, you know, is going through their experience and, and taking the time to, to really well, try and understand what that experience is. And even where you don't understand, just recognizing that, like I said, as long as it's not destructive, um, as long as it, 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 it doesn't impact on society in a particular way, like I'm happy to let them go through that. But it's th this element of understanding um, and taking the time to try and understand. Well, again, we, we have limited resources in that respect. You can't take time to understand everybody. Otherwise, you're going to be so busy doing that all day, you're going to get nothing else done. And we were talking about earlier how you know, it's impossible these days. Someone gave me a useful definition a while ago, which I quite like. Empathy is putting yourself in someone else's shoes, which is difficult for all of us to do because we don't know what path they walked, right? Mm -hmm. So empathy is a much harder, much more difficult mountain to climb if you truly wish to be empathetic. I almost prefer the definition for compassion, where even though you don't necessarily understand someone's life and you haven't been there every step of the way with them, you can still make an effort to take them seriously and to appreciate their experience and to, and to, to sympathize in some way with what difficulties they've been through. And I think compassion and empathy are quite different things. Um, someone explained that to me once, and I'm not even sure if I've explained it properly enough here. Mm. You know, I, Gareth, it's interesting. Like, I think we talk about words like compassion and empathy where, where we live in a society where, you know, you're a person who deals with the public. But if you're, if you're dealing one-on-one -on -one with people, which is what we're doing most of the time, we don't even mm. get to compassion and empathy because most of us can't even listen. It's so, and it, that thing is so critical. Like it's such a critical step before anything else happens. You know, oh, somebody is telling me about their experience. Let me listen and not have a knee jerk, you know, opposite reaction to whatever that, whatever's coming at me. And it's, it, for me, that's changed so many things because I know myself how the, that compassion and the empathy has only come after I've shut my mouth. Mm. Yeah. And I guess it's, it's also the, it's also the thing of not having to have an opinion about everything. Um, and sometimes, like you're saying, totally. sometimes sometimes actually just kind of listening and and taking it in, and it you know it is what it is. Like I, you know, I acknowledge yeah. I acknowledge you. I've heard you. Um, I don't need to now counteract you. I don't need to have yeah. a debate with you about it. It's just like oh. okay, well, that's interesting. That's an interesting perspective. Thank you, and move on. Oh, I mean, yeah. I, I I I don't do it. I don't do it well. <laughs> but me either yeah. it's hard for a lot of us but even worse are those people who they listen to you but then they try to solve your problems for you like um it's this patronizing idea that oh i know how to get out of the tussle you're in i've got some information that you know you immediately assume that you know more than that person and you're going to solve their problems that's the worst but you know what i've been guilty of that because i'm a person who you know i that is my knee jerk and i've had to teach myself mm -hmm. not to do that so Kojo, you talk about like oh, how do we teach empathy it's like 
oh, firstly, what is your intention? And it took mm. me a long time to understand, wait, what do I want out of these interactions that I'm having? Oh, maybe mm. I do want more information. I want to learn something. In order to listen, I'm going to have to change my thing, my knee-jerk thing, which is what you describe, of trying to, trying to give yeah. my opinion on a subject or trying to solve a problem that's in front of me, you know? I'm just thinking trying to navigate, like, marriage, right? Um, yeah. And, 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 you, being, and, and being... Yeah, and, you talk and being married, married is, yeah yeah i mean being married is is something where you know the other person is telling you something uh, and i'm also instinctively like a problem solver you know so it's like this person at work is doing this and it's like well actually what you should be doing is this and actually and the person just wanted you to listen they yeah. just wanted to, they just wanted you 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 know they just wanted to be able to vent right um, and and yeah. just kind of get get stuff out of their head and off their chest and there you are now jumping in and going yeah well what you should do is like you know to hell with them and you must do this and you must call your boss and you must go to hr and totally. say, actually i didn't want any of that i just wanted you to listen mm. you mm. You, um, you also write in the book about uh, substance abuse which is something i didn't know that you you'd been through these tussles um, yeah. Tell us, tell us a little bit about that, because that must have been difficult to write, you know, especially because most people are ashamed of these things, or they they haven't yet dealt with them in a significant way, or perhaps they're worried about what people will think of them, or how it could impact on their career. Um, how did that come come about? I mean, I I've, I guess I'd shared the story before, just never never at this level, um, and and I kind of. I, I, to a certain extent, I've built like a career of just telling the stuff that I've gone through. Um, and I did it in, it, well, let's say, in smaller ways. Like it was an editor's note, or it was a blog post, or or that sort of stuff. I mean, I actually even used to do, I used to do some kind of drug education, um, going around to schools and kind of talking about it. Um, and it was it was kind of me coming to Joburg, and and um, yeah, getting. A little caught up in let's call it the rave scene in those days. I mean, like the late the late nineties, um, uh, but it was more around in my my inadequacies as a, you know my adequacies as a human being, and and that you know, with, I mean before before I even moved to Joburg and had you know issues with certain substances, I had problems with alcohol. Um, growing up in a small town where where literally that's what you do. Um, yeah. You know, you you drink. You that's the first thing that you do on a Saturday. You have your first drink around lunchtime, and you know you're just popping a can of this, and then by the time it gets darker, you you're you're drinking you know other things. Um, so it was it was a journey, and fortunately for me, it was it was primarily within a year, um, and I had people around me that that kind of opened me up and or at least gave me options and exposed me to the options and and part of that journey of getting off it was starting to do that work on myself like and starting to understand you know understand what you know understand myself and understand my triggers and that sort of stuff um and it's been long enough that uh, i don't know if we have I don't know if in South Africa we have a statute of limitations. I mean, we watch so many American movies, we understand we understand yeah. their we understand yeah. their laws better than ours. Right. Uh, but but I figured you know like 20, 20 years, twenty yeah. years is a good it, it's a good enough period to leave between it uh, that I hope yeah, I no I nobody official will come chasing after me. Um, no, that's expired. You don't have to worry. <laughs> <laughs> Like I think people's attitudes to, to drugs have changed so much. You said something really interesting at the beginning of this uh, explanation that you've just given for why you included it in the book. You said you were dealing with some stuff. And I think, you know, it refers back to that experiment they've done with the with the mice where they put them in a in a cage and they they give the mouse on its own, they they give it uh, cocaine in the water and it keeps coming back and it and it drinks only the two the two little um water things and the one is just plain water and the other one's got cocaine and the mouse that's on its own has to have the cocaine water and the mouse that's got company and that has you know things to play on and things to do in its cage it drinks the normal water they never choose the cocaine water so mm -hmm. i i think that that's a really interesting explanation of why so many people get into it and it's not because they just 
didn't have anything else to do or because they were bored or because there was peer pressure. It's usually because there's something that they don't have or that they're striving for or that they feel left out of. There's some issue that's holding them back. And the drugs kind of help them to assuage any kind of feelings of insecurity. Um, and that's where it starts, certainly. Uh, yeah, I mean, absolutely. I think that's where it starts. I mean, it, you know, everybody goes to it, but different people go, get to it in different ways. I mean, mine was literally just a Saturday afternoon. I'd been drinking and had a joint, and I was ha having a, a disagreement with a young lady um, who, who, who's, whose opinion mattered. And I wasn't getting high. And I was with a friend of mine, and I was like, listen, like, Okay, this is irritating now. I need, you know, I need something that'll just, you know, help me forget about all this stuff and, you know, numb me a little bit. Um, and then we can go partying after this. And he gave right. me a, he gave me a white pill and said they gave me half of it and said chew on it. Yeah. I was like, okay, it tastes like crap, but I'll do that. And um, and then you know, uh, two two three hours later, I'm looking at the lights and going, oh my god, look at those lights. <laughs> and and that's kind of and, and then it became kind of like part of my it became part of my lifestyle i mean i used to park outside i stayed i stayed with my my aunt slash my mom um in in craigle so i used to drive past hyde park and in those days hyde park had these purple lights on top i don't know if you if you know some of you, some of you some of us are old enough to remember but these like hyde park was purple after midnight Mm -hmm. And I'd actually park on the side of the road um, after after having had um, you know a couple of ecstasy pills and maybe a couple of lines of cocaine, and I'd park on the side of the road at four o'clock in the morning and just gaze at Hyde Park. Oh mm -hmm. my gosh! I mean, Kojo, you think that's bad? You're talking about the early rave scene in in yeah. Joburg. You know, I I developed a strong affinity for bomber jackets. It was also a lifestyle. <laughs> <laughs> Well, so my bomber jacket, but, but I, mean, I had no problem with bomber jackets because my bomber jacket was actually a probably a decade <laughs> earlier. Uh, I was in uh -oh. Germany and, and, and I had a public enemy bomber jacket. Ooh, and, and that was that, that was like no, my pride, good. my pride and joy. And I you loved it. You got into the rave scene. You had to wear that thing somewhere. <laughs> no. You win. It's not your fault. All right. Well, the book is uh, it's out now. It, it is available. You can get it online, right? So that's the best place to buy it. And it's called Listen to Your Footsteps by Kojo Bafoy. There's the uh, the cover. Uh, that's a good picture of you. Who took that? Uh, Victor Dlamini. Very um, nice. Good, fr good, good friend of mine, and he takes amazing pictures. All right. So Listen to Your Footsteps is the book, and uh, Kojo is doing what he does so well. He's also... Uh, been on on uh, Kaya FM for those people who don't know Black Magazine, Destiny Man, Afropolitan, so many things to talk about, and we've always uh, got time to talk to you. Thanks, Kojo. Nice to see you, man. Thanks, you guys. Congrats on the back. All right, yeah, thank you. Very good. Cheers, Kojo. There he is.